Uh, nice to have a little crew of people here. Um, so we are uh, sort of having our special holiday uh, fire sale on art knowledge. Um, and uh, there are a couple of things that I want to do uh, during uh, our time today. Um, firstly, if we go to the course calendar, um, it looks like we are moving into coding. And um, I have some sort of like, today we're gonna talk about some like general sort of um, art idea type things that apply to coding. Um, obviously it being kind of the day before the um, holiday, um, I didn't wanna like introduce any new technical content. Um, so that being said, we're gonna take a day uh, to sort of not do anything technical. We're gonna just talk about art and how some of these ideas about coding and artificial intelligence kind of feed into that. And also, um, if you stick around, or maybe if you're watching the video from home, um, I'm gonna give you a great prescription for uh, killing time uh, if you're spending time with your family this weekend and you're looking for something else to do. Um, obviously, it's all wonderful for us to spend time with our families, but um, did you know that you could make AI art on your phone while you're doing that? Um, literally, so um, it's a great way to sort of just like have you know a thing to do. Um, if you need something like that, um, it's possible some people might. So uh, yeah, we're gonna just go ahead and jump into that. So before I begin, um, does anybody have any sort of questions about what's coming down um, and all that? Hi. No? I can take questions at the end too if anybody has any questions that they wanna ask. Um, so yeah, we're going to um, start with this uh, sort of slide presentation on generative art. Um, if you had looked, I know I sort of tell everybody this, but um, I made some significant updates to this one um, just uh, yesterday. So uh, if you're one of those people that looks at the notes before the lecture, I did just want to let you know that there are a few significant changes here. Um, so uh, yeah, generative art basically is, I think, to sort of it doesn't have to be digital, but it often is, right? I'm gonna show you an example of what an uh, sort of analog or physical generative project might look like. Um, but put simply, generative art is art made by executing programmed instructions, whether those instructions are real or like as in step two feet from the podium, turn 90 degrees, step one foot this way, uh, turn 90 degrees to this direction, and then bang your head on the podium. Um, that technically could be like a, perf a generative performance. Um, so there is a space for non-digital generative work, and there are people who actively sort of practice that. Um, but primarily when people talk about generative art, they're talking about work that is made from computer code. Um, so it just has that kind of like notable exception in there. So there's a couple of sort of like art ideas that have come and go, gone in history. We've sort of talked about quite a few of them when we were talking about the history of art and technology parts one and two, where we're sort of thinking about what are those um, impacts that technology has on our own assumptions about what makes good or bad art, right? So with generative art, um, when generative art first started happening, it was actually in that sort of 60s and 70s period that I showed you in the history of art and technology part two. Um, <laughs> that's basically sort of like the genesis of computer generated art and also generative art. Um, the sort of early computer art stuff, people don't usually think of that as generative art because at the time there was really no other way to create computer art. Now, like, post maybe 1990, um, if you're making generative art, you're usually making a conscious choice to engage in computer code. Um, because I think we can all sort of safely say, Photoshop does certain things, right? And they could lead to the creation of a work of art, and you don't have to know anything about computer code in order to use Photoshop, right? So if you wanna to say to yourself like, okay, I'm gonna be a generative artist, it's really like I'm gonna dive into the world of the sort of algorithm. I'm gonna really be engaged with computer code and algorithms. Um, and one of the sort of criticisms of generative art, I've got two here on the screen, um, is that basically generative art has no kind of quote unquote, um, big air quotes here from me, 
uh, no human element. <laughs> um, and I mean, that's sort of just, uh, the, basically generative art is just like alien. It's sort of made by the computer. It's for the computer. It doesn't really, um, doesn't really connect with our lives. It doesn't connect with our lived experiences in making it. Um, and I guess like as a practitioner of generative art sometimes, um, I think that's absurd personally, <laughs> but um, I can understand why at a certain time, uh, at a certain moment in history, maybe that was a view that was, you know, was sort of like widely held. Um, and then um, maybe my, I guess my sort of personal response to that would be that maybe if somebody's saying that generative art lacks humanity, maybe they need to question what the, what it means to be human and what are the boundaries of being human. Right. Um, so, okay, number two, this is the <laughs> sort of second thing um, that kind of has dogged um, generative art over history. And that is that there's this perception that the artist has zero control and that the machine is actually doing all of the work. Um, and that's kind of, that's definitely still out there as an idea. Um, I think that the rise of like cinema VFX have actually brought sort of like a popular level of appreciation to computer graphics that maybe have, has helped a little bit, um, that people are starting to just like accept that as artwork. Um, but particularly with generative art, I think that the, the challenge is that um, in like, let's say even a 3D modeler like Rhino, you, you the artist are making a lot of decisions as you go along the way, right? And you're sort of controlling this interface that so and the interface kind of probably reminds you or is built to remind hum humans in general of other things that exist in reality. And, you know, computer code can be kind of like, um, if people don't know how to read it or know how to sort of work with it, it can be a little bit more intimidating in some ways. So, um, so of course, people sort of um, adopt this mentality that, like, if you're not sort of like, uh, it's in some ways it's kind of an absurdist mentality because like I wouldn't I wouldn't walk up to a painter and I if like let's just use painting as an example because it's sort of pretty easy to like you know consider um, if I walked up to a painter I would never say where did you get that paintbrush who designed that paintbrush were you involved with the designing of that paintbrush and and if not why why are you such a terrible person like. <laughs> I would, I would never do that in like a hundred years, maybe a thousand years. Um, but yeah, with, with digital work, you know, there is this sort of like conversation that sometimes happens about like, are you actually controlling the output of the work and where is your sort of individual contribution in the, in the output of the work? And so unfortunately, that's just kind of a, a conversation that continues. And I think that's sort of resolved itself now for generative art. I think generative art is actually pretty accepted. This whole conversation about making and knowledge um, of making is actually getting kind of transferred to AI art, which we're gonna talk about for quite a bit today. Um, so just to kind of remind you, I have a couple of slides that are related to other things that we've looked at um, throughout the semester. Throughout the 20th, uh, 20th century, we already had this sort of um, movement in painting that was trying to reduce work down to its most basic components. Um, most people would consider that like a modernist sort of orientation where uh, they wanted to maybe slightly misguidedly maybe create a, an artwork that was kind of universal, right? Um, in other words, it would have meaning even if people don't speak the same verbal language, they would be able to see this form and there would be some sort of shared knowledge exchanged. Um, and in order to do that, things just get simplified, simplified, simplified. So, so into that sort of environment comes this artist who really kind of made uh, generative art. And I think that this artist is widely regarded as the sort of progenitor or like the um, uh, popularizer of generative art. And he did not, at least early on in his career, he did not use a computer. So he was somebody who got started in the 60s and 70s, and then like moving into the 80s, 2000s, and he's still, I think, alive today. Um, he, oh no, he died 
a few years ago. But anyway, into the recent past, he was making computer-generated work, but he started off making this work where he would literally write a set of instructions, and this is the work. Um, so you can see uh, that the work is, if I can just zoom in on this for just one second. Um, this is a typical Solowit piece. Draw a six inch grid with a hard nine, nine inch pencil. From the four corners of the wall, draw straight blue lines to random points on the grid, red lines, and on and on it goes. And so literally anyone that has this piece of paper um, can create a Solowit in their, on their own property. Um, and also, the other kind of mind-blowing thing for people about this was that when the work was created, it really didn't have any particular value. So he would sell these little pieces of paper, these little certificates for like, I think he sold one of them for like $6 million, which back then was a ton of money. Um, and somebody could re-execute the artwork anywhere they wanted. So the actual physical, the physical thing, right, like the thing that's installed on the wall is basically worthless. Like, it's just sort of proof that you have this idea or that you have access to this idea. And so anyway, it's kind of an important moment in art because it's, it's really started to sort of make people think, like, do I need a physical object or do I just need the method to make it, right? Or do I need the... Um, the whole system that goes along with having a wall and paint and, you know, it's all tied into capital and business and all this stuff. So, um, so this idea of divorcing the art object or the physical object from the, um, the instructions is something that digital media artists were like, oh, awesome, we can do that. <laughs> um, we've been doing that for decades already and that's really cool that it's art now. So um, you start to see this like, explosion of generative art come out of the computer art world. And that kind of happens, as I said before, like mostly within the 60s and 70s. Um, let me get back to normal. So you see in sort of early generative art this interest in difference um, and exploring uh, the potential of, of a system. So for example, like if I made my sort of little turn around the podium and bang my head thing. Um, if that was my set of instructions for a performance and maybe that was like computer code, I would do a piece, this like a typical generative art piece would be like, how many different ways can I move around the podium and bang my head on it? <laughs> Which, like literally, that would be something that people would do. Um, I'm not exaggerating. Um, and so what, but the idea behind it is really that you're interested in creating a system that creates many more outputs than uh, what you put into it is something very simple, right? Um, and so you see that just as like an ongoing theme in uh, generative art. Um, also, you know, the idea of, to a certain extent, training algorithms. Um, the other sort of main, I would say, thrust or like movement in um, generative art in the last like 30 years is this idea of emergence and the idea of trying to capture things that are not necessarily things that we would normally capture in code. So like for example, in this image that we're looking at right now, um, it's based on a data representation, but it also sort of has this look of maybe not being generated. Like it looks like it could actually be based on natural information. Um, so that's like kind of the, the trend of maybe like the last 20 years with um, generative art. You see a lot of artists that are sort of like trying to work towards something that's literally not a grid, <laughs> right? They wanna like move past that and kind of move into something that's a little more sophisticated and maybe a little bit more engaged with the natural world. Now, I mean, we also mentioned this idea of like data. Um, it's hard to separate generative art from data visualization, and I don't really know if, if one would, is, would be well advised to try. I know lots of people in the community and even like, yeah, just people that I know from conferences and stuff like that that are doing work that combines uh, data visualization with uh, generative elements. So there's like an element of reality and then the generative part is actually like the kind of fantasy realm. It doesn't necessarily correspond to reality where with the data visualization, 
theoretically, that data comes from something real, right? Like in this case, it's every street ever by brightness um, in the United States, in the continental United States. Um, also, I don't know, I think some people in this um, room might be a little bit close to graduation or maybe thinking about what they're going to do with their lives. Um, most interesting careers that my former students have gone on to do, uh, so these are people who usually have uh, art and CS, significant amount of coursework in each. A couple of them have gone to this um, master's program in data visualization at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and then they've come out and gotten jobs, which is awesome. <laughs> so, um, and they're cool jobs too. So um, it's definitely like that sort of idea of scientific visualization or how do you, you know, start with reality and then think of something that could be sort of expanded on maybe generatively. Um, that type of work is, you know, people are, people are paying for that right now. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, there are also people who really try to take this, you know, away from that kind of data-infused um, direction and are just trying to make com things completely, like, out of whole cloth. So um, Jared Tarbell is a really important um, sort of artist in the generative art scene, and he um, really tries to create these systems that mimic, like, natural form. Um, and I'm always like super interested in what he's doing because he makes work that is probably within the realm of, not to like quote from our video from last week, um, but these are probably within the realm of the uncanny, right? Where it's like, is that a th real thing or is it not? Um, and definitely like that idea of uncanniness um, is something that is just sort of like with us. And as we move into talking a little bit about AI art, that's where the uncanniness like gets turned up to 111. <laughs> um, so with AI art, I think it's a really like kind of a, well, I mean, you can see when we switch over it, it's just visually, it's much wilder. Um, so we're gonna spend some time talking about AI generated art. I have a couple of slides to sort of talk about how I, AI generated work um, evolves and how it exists. Um, but then I also, um, I have this like mega slide at the bottom here, which is basically just, um, I'm gonna show you some websites uh, where you can actually make AI generated art and I'll show you some of my portfolio. I did a lot of AI uh, generated work over the summer, um, mostly because I was just curious about what you could do. So um, yeah, and I was also thinking, what would be a great way to like reward everybody who is attending class today? Like a wonderful person. Hang on, let me turn my uh, microphone off for a second. And we're back with that secret incentive um, taken. Okay, so, um, so when we start thinking about AI-generated art, I mean, if you haven't heard about AI-generated art in the last year, um, I, you might have some like time on Reddit maybe to catch up on or something. Um, it's just like literally everywhere right now. Um, and there's so much good information about it. And there are so many good engines that uh, people like you and me can actually use. We don't have to be, you know, coding geniuses. Um, so I think that um, one of the questions that I wanted to answer for you all since we talked about generative art today is, you know, maybe question one, is AI art generative art? Um, and basically, I think the answer is, I don't know. Um, I think it's too soon to tell. I think AI art has been around for decades, um, but li literally, like just in the last year, it's sort of uh, achieving some like threshold of public attention where people like know what it is now and have seen these images, and you know. Um, so I think that the generative art community in general is a little bit hostile to AI art for the, some of the reasons that I pointed out earlier, like, because I think AI art in some ways is democratizing to a point that people find a little bit annoying. I mean, I feel like that's a gate, kind of a gatekeeping conversation, you know? And so, yeah, yes, hello. Totally true. Yeah. 
For sure. Um, Michaela, you had something also? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's super, for sure. It's, well, the whole idea of people's Im images being used without their consent is really awful. I mean, it, one thing, though, that it makes me kind of realize, and this is, like, maybe somewhat vindicating, like, my grouchy uncle, you know, who's like, oh, all that information, and, you know, you signed it away. And, like, on certain social networks, like, when you sign up for your account, like, they're pretty upfront about saying, we own your images. And, and people still post to, you know, and I'm not saying that's the case with yours, because I've even been thinking about, like, images that I posted to Facebook, like, 15 years ago, you know? Like, they're still out there. <laughs> and they probably are being used, being used for an AI engine. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm hmm Oh, for sure. Right. Well, so there's this article um, from Wired Magazine that I linked to actually talks about some of those issues that y'all are bringing up. So, but the way they talk about it is more in terms of like, how does the museum industry honor all the laborers whose knowledge went into the creation of this work, right? So if I make a work as like an a that's an AI artwork and I say this is a Meg Mitchell, you like witness my brilliance. <laughs> that um, obviously I would never do that, but like you know, literally that would be a, like kind of a um, that would make me a bad person, basically. <laughs> um, but like. Uh, all these museum people are now kind of asking themselves, like, do we need to have the prompt along with the image in order to own it? And do we even need to acquire the training set of images? Like, they're asking those questions. And I think that in some ways those are, like, really savvy questions to be asking, right? Because, um, yeah, it's, it is about, like, the ecosystem that it exists in just as much as it is the fact that I can say cat riding on a surfboard and get something that looks pretty good, right? Um, yeah, well, so, yeah, the, the AI thing right now is really crazy, and I like, wasn't even 100% sure how to like, address it, just because it's um, from month to month, you know, it's like moving so fast. Um, but definitely, I think the generative art community is a little bit hostile to AI algorithms for that sort of same like, thing about knowledge that basically, if I do put in a prompt that says cat riding a surfboard, that doesn't really somehow make me knowledgeable about all of the ways in which it was created algorithmically. And generative artists in general are really close to their technology and their technique. And, you know, so they're kind of not interested in it in that way. Um, but I also think that, like, it's just another, it's, it's in some ways it's the same argument that was used to delegitimize um, generative artists working 20 or 30 years ago. And it's just, you know, kind of shifted over to a new genre. So I think for the most part, like any sort of gatekeeping conversations or like convers when you start to hear about something becoming overly democratized, like that sort of sets off my spidey senses that maybe there's, maybe it's about something else and maybe it's not about like wanting to be a really good coder. Maybe, again. And I don't know. We'll have to wait until history figures it out. Um, but just a couple of years ago, like, AI was sort of, like, more coveted for its failures. Um, and so this is just from a couple of years ago. Um, and I think that one thing that you're starting to see right now with the newer AI engines is this sort of move towards... Um, almost like a pseudo-spiritual kind of, like aesthetic, where um, even just a couple years ago, I'll show you another couple from just recently. Um, so these are from like five years ago. And this was at the point where AI couldn't really, couldn't really do faces. It couldn't really do like human figures accurately. 
and so artists in, in, at this time, artists were kind of like reveling in the weirdness. And they actually call it, by the way, the weirdness. Um, but, um, but now, as we look at the newer uh, images that are coming out of the AI engines, like it's just sort of um, like the level of complexity in the images is just skyrocketing. And also the level of sort of like accuracy to the prompt is really getting yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little scary. Um, so, okay, so there's two articles here, just like if you're interested in the topic or you wanna start making AI work for yourself. Um, there's a short article from the New York Times that has some kind of interesting just like arguments about where AI art is in sort of the public um, respect. And then um, this article really talks specifically about AI art curation, which has to do with all the sort of like institutional issues about how it can be bought, sold, recognized, you know, moved through that kind of um, thing. And then I put down just, these are the three, um, the three AI art uh, generators that I have used uh, recently. And um, they're definitely like, probably I would say in general, probably like definitely Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion are two of the biggest ones. Um, I like Night Cafe Studio because I can do it on my phone. <laughs> and um, it's sort of like, um, it's like if you could make Candy Crush into an art app, it's basically like, it's that addictive. <laughs> so, so be warned. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I did, I think I wanted to show you some of the stuff that I kicked up on. Um, so I also put some Instagram hashtags in there because I do think that the best way to look at AI art is just like in real time. So this is like what's come out this morning. That is definitely AI generated. Um, uh, yeah, this, this was, I love this one, with spaghetti. I mean, it's just like totally crazy, obviously. Um, so yeah, I like, there's a whole sort of, and basically if you just like use as a hashtag like all of the, you know, um, Night Cafe, Stable Diffusion, Dolly 2, it usually brings up sort of like the, who's, you know, the best of what has recently been um, uh, captured in those platforms. Um, let me show you my thing here. So, Night Cafe, most of the um, AI generators, if you've never tried one, they basically work based on a, um, on a prompt. And so if I were to, so Night Cafe is actually like a company that kind of packages multiple AI engines and then lets you like make a print, ship it to somebody's house, sell it to them. So it's more like uh, geared towards if you wanted to start your own business making artwork. Um, but I use it just because I think the interface is really easy. Um, the, uh, the one that I tend to use the most is this text-to-image one. Um, they're all fine, but they, as you can see by the examples, um, they generate you know, somewhat different results. Like, um, and I tend to like the sort of more landscape-y, complex images for my own work because I deal a lot with landscape themes. Um, so yeah, I could come in here and um, my text prompt, hmm, the entrance to hell, that's a good suggestion. Um, also, learning to spell is helpful. Okay, I think I finally figured out how to spell that word. Um, and so, yeah, definitely like one of the things that I've been doing with, um, with the AI is using a starting image. Um, I don't have one on hand right now, so I won't use one, but I'll show you a couple of examples where I have a really good starting image. And pretty much one of the things that I've learned is that if you, if you want your AI art to look like something, good luck. Like, 
ask, feeding it an image and asking it to sort of replicate that image doesn't, like that doesn't really happen. If you feed it an image and maybe the image is like, has a mountain in it, you'll wind up with stuff in that spot um, if that's your sort of root image. So it doesn't really dictate like the way that your image looks in the end, but it sort of affects the weight of where stuff goes. Um, it can also affect like kind of the, um, kind of the run here. So this, I just, every AI engine has sort of like an option of whether you wanna run it short or long. Um, and pretty much longer is always, in my opinion, longer is always better. Um, because it just kind of adds more complexity, more finish, more detail. Um, and it does take some time. So I'll just show you the, um, some of the rest of my creations. Um, so I started playing around on this in the summer, and I got a ton of stuff that I wasn't happy with. Um, I started playing around with, like, landscapes. Um, and those were going pretty well, but I kind of wanted them to be a little bit, like, I wanted to amp up the crazy a little bit. Um, and they just weren't really sort of doing it for me. So that's when I started adding, um, I started adding a reference image. And I think I brought in the reference image somewhere around here. Um, and so my prompt was like Victorian fern underground cats. And one thing that I really noticed really quickly with this particular generator is that um, it, uh, it doesn't really understand the differences between categories of things like cats and plants. Um, and that was very interesting and very creepy to me. So I did more of it. Um, and then at some point, I sort of like got on this whole trip of like trying just different painting styles. Again, cats and ferns, like does not know the difference. Also does not know the difference between cats and dogs. Um, and then, yeah, different illustration style, but same problem, right? Like, what's wrong with my nose? Um, and yeah, in general, it was just sort of like, fascinated by the fact that all these things were sort of just glommed together in, into one thing, you know? Um, and then I started mixing it up with some style. And this probably was one of the images that I liked the best out of all of the images that I came up with. Um, I think I used a different stylistic prompt here. I used a cyberpunk prompt instead of a Victorian prompt. Um, but the original image is sort of still here. And it's the same reference image that I use for all of them. Um, you can see it's right here. Um, and so really what I feel like the reference image does is it just sort of creates like a, almost like a grid to like superimpose things on. So it's, from my perspective, it's been more about like how the, how the structure of the image is rather than like the color or the brightness or the, you know, any of that stuff. It's gonna just get basically mowed over by the algorithm. Um, and you can also, you know, with, if you use a prompt, you can also set the prompt weight. So if you want the prompt weight to, like if your prompt is a mountain and you want your image to look like a mountain, you can set it all the way up and it'll, you know, replicate whatever that is. But that mountain still might be full of like marshmallows or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's super weird. Um, so here's our sort of like little image that we just generated. Um, so this is the entrance to bureaucratic hell. It's not wrong. Um, it's not exactly right either. Um, I have a feeling that if we, and this is where it gets to be like super addictive, um, if you, uh, you can basically take this image and fork it. Um, and then you can also sort of, uh, It's interesting. It might just be because I just did it. It's not listing this as an option. Um, but after it's been on the server for a couple seconds, you should be able to like go in and basically like re-algorithm it. So you can modify it um, into another form. And usually what I have done in a couple of cases is just to basically take it and just process it for longer. So it just generates more weirdness. 
literally, more weirdness. Um, so yeah, that's sort of like, in a nutshell, what Night, Night Cafe is all about. Um, Night Cafe is free until you kind of don't want it to be, um, and then it costs money. Um, and that's kind of annoying. Although, I have to say, I think I spent like 20 bucks on it, and that pretty much carried me through the whole summer. Um, so uh, Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion are both sort of fully free. Um, I mean, I think if you're interested in this, you should just give them a try. I don't think that one is necessarily like harder than the other. I think that Stable Diffusion is amazing, but it tends to like, if you really want to try to do something specific in Stable Diffusion or like control it, it pretty quickly will for fork you into like technical manuals and things like that, you know, and sort of like um, a lot of people who are using Stable Diffusion are actually installing it on their own sort of servers or cloud computing networks. So um, it just depends on what kind of an interface you want to have. If you want to have a really easy sort of, you know, phonified, in, in, um, phonified uh, interface, or if you want to have an interface where you download a bunch of code and install it on a server. Um, so you'll get two different types of experiences with that. Um, but yeah, I would definitely, definitely recommend the, the AI, if for no other reason than it's actually super fun. So, hello. <laughs> I'm pretty much good as far as like the, the content. Um, do y'all have any questions? Any like ethical problems with, <laughs> with, uh, with AI art? I do, th I guess here's, okay, I'm gonna make some grand prediction. Um, I do think that AI art is gonna be a big problem for the, for the art world. And I don't mean like, a problem in terms of like that it's going to make art worse. I don't think art needs to, you know, be great uh, again or anything like that. Um, I'm saying, thinking more that it's going to be a problem for the art industry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, any other questions? Okay. Um, also, I guess if you're here, I'll give you the sort of like extra little introduction. Um, so I have an assignment down here for uh, after Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, let's see. So, well, you should hopefully do it after Thanksgiving. Let me take a, let me take a quick look at these. Oh. You guys are getting all the perks today. I'm gonna extend this deadline a week. Sorry, <laughs> I just, it's not, that's not reasonable to have it due like right after Thanksgiving because, um, yeah. Y'all are gonna be busy m making AI art and, you know. <laughs> um, let me just really quickly change this while I'm looking at it, so. Okay, but in any case, we do have this this thing, this assignment that is coming up. Um, so it's a, a week, you have a week longer to work on it. Um, so yeah, that was totally just a mistake. Like I can't imagine giving you all an assignment that I hadn't sort of presented on in class uh, in advance of. So, um, so when we do get to that, if you wanna get a little bit ahead on that, um, and again, I'll be kind of sort of covering this fully on Tuesday when I come back. Um, we're gonna be jumping into p5.js, which um, I'll probably give you like a good sort of like talking uh, about uh, before we sort of get into actually coding with it. Um, but it's basically like a way to learn coding, but it's also a way to actually make stuff that you can use um, in various contexts. So um, one of the main ways that people use p5.js projects is on the web. Um, and when I say on the web, I also mean the this. Um, so you can make apps with it um, and uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's uh, in general, it's just sort of a good sort of like um, introduction. So if you're thinking about maybe like cracking into this a little bit um, over break, I would go to the editor. Um, and of course, all the course content, you know, the slides and stuff are up. 
Um, but basically within the editor, you have the opportunity to um, play things. And right now we're playing like a black or a gray background. Um, I'm not actually gonna go any further than this today, but like if you feel like sort of jumping in, uh, you could. Um, and uh, yeah, all right, well, uh, with that, we'll, more on this later, and uh, we'll have, uh, I hope everyone claims their extra credit po point today. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> for people who attended class in person, one, one time only. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll see you all uh, later uh, on Tuesday. Uh, have a wonderful break. <laughs>